it's a, a important topic that you know, Trisha started two weeks ago or two times ago that we preached. She f first started with deliverance, and then last time I spoke on uh, breaking curses, and I talked about the two major ways that, that they come into our lives, and it's kind of obvious. Sometimes it's our fault because we're disobedient, and we do things that, that open up a door to the enemy. And then other times, something happens outside of our sphere, but we don't see a connection. But um, just by way of review, before I go over that verse, last week I also talked about Proverbs 26.2, and it says, like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without a cause will not alight. Okay, so if you are dealing with something that feels like it must be something bigger than just the circumstances, like you see a recurring pattern, then if there, you, what you want to do is ask the Lord for what the cause is. Amen? Sing, uh, sound like it's ringing true to you? Because uh, there's some people that think, well, I'm a Christian now, and I can't be subject to any of that demonic attack or any of that demonic influence. And I wish that were true. I, I really do. We said that last week. We, we don't like having to deal with the dark stuff in the world. But God gave us the weapons to do it. And I just like what it says in 2 Samuel 21, there was a famine in the days of David. Does that sound like a curse? <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, you can't eat, and people are dying because there's a famine in the land. And what did David do? The first thing he did, that's a question, he inquired of the Lord. How about you? Is that the first thing you do? Well, that's a good answer. I hope it's true. We should be people that first inquire of the Lord. And that's, that's going to be a recurring theme of what I talk about and what church is has talked about is that if you see a pattern of things, destructive behavior that goes beyond just a normal, uh, you know, like let's just say accident prone situation where over and over again you see this recurring pattern. I shared last week about in my family lots of premature deaths, lots of pregnancies terminated or babies, uh, my mom almost dying as a blue baby and then her losing a baby. It's like, wait a minute, there's something bigger going on here. We need to sever that tie in our generational line. We need to break it, which is exactly what she talked about when she was down in Texas, about how when our second son uh, was about to be born, the doctors told her he was dead. In the, in the operating room, you could see the, the testimony on uh, Facebook or YouTube channel for us. It's really powerful how we were speaking for those whole nine months over her womb that that baby was going to live. And he did. And he's alive. And he's doing great. And, you know, God will answer. You have to inquire. We don't like to wait. We want the answer right away, don't we? Let's just be honest. But look, that's not how it always works. And sometimes it's to help us to learn, to teach us that this isn't a microwave kind of existence. We're in a marathon race, not a sprint race, and you keep taking ground. You might not be getting all the ground that you want, but you don't go backwards. You keep taking more ground for the Lord, and you, you shut doors, right? And forgiveness, I talked about Joyce Meyer last week and, and how important it was that she had to forgive her father. As difficult and almost, you could say, impossible as it would be if you were in her situation. And you can go online and see this testimony I'm talking about. It's called One Life by Joyce Meyer. And, and it's, it's really like otherworldly, the supernatural ability God can give you to forgive somebody who's hurt you to the extent her father hurt her. And she got free when she forgave him. Isn't that amazing? He got free and he got saved. But she also got free because now that bitterness of unforgiveness wasn't in her. That curse was broken. She didn't have anything to do with it. He, he did it to her, but she was still suffering under a curse. Doesn't seem fair, does it? But it's not because God's not fair. It's because the devil's a mean boss. And when Adam and Eve sinned, that opened the door to a war. And we just have to deal with the reality of that. And we have way more weapons than the enemy does. But we want to keep ourselves strong. <laughs> All right, so it says that the Lord answered him. I love that. There's a famine. David's like, what's going on? Three years of a famine? Lord, why? What's the reason? And then it says the Lord answered. So hold on to that. When you're not sure what the cause of things are, hold on to it that the Lord will answer you. And, you, you know, you can fast. You can pray. You can press in. Maybe he is answering, and you're just not hearing because you're not listening hard enough. And something about fasting will will make it more of a serious thing. Like, I need to hear. I'm going to press in and hear from the Lord. 
And then I just gave you Hosea 4, 6, which I'm guessing most of you know this verse because it's such a core principle that we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And if you look right above that, who was being destroyed for a lack of knowledge? Saul. <laughs> if you know the story, Saul was being destroyed because he broke a covenant. I can't go into all the details of the story, but you might remember when Joshua was first came into the land and he was conquering the land, he got tricked by one of the tribes. And, and he made a covenant with a tribe because he thought they were from uh, far, a distant land, and they tricked him into thinking that, but he, they were really local. And but you know what? But because they made a covenant, they said, we made an oath, and we're not going to kill you. Now you're going to be our slaves, but we're not going to kill you. And God really cares about that, doesn't he? Amen. Cares about oaths. So all these generations later, Saul killed the Gibeonites, and that broke that oath. And now there's a famine on the land. All the people are suffering because of what the king did. And when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But the opposite's true too, isn't it? And that's why our leadership's so important. That's why the Bible cares so much about you that he doesn't want just anybody standing up here behind a pulpit. <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of testing and trials and discipline the Lord puts you through when you're in ministry. And it's because of how much he loves you. He doesn't want a false shepherd tending a flock of sheep because you're vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. And we need godly people over us that we can trust. Amen? So I'm not going to be destroyed by a lack of knowledge. Saul was. He allowed, it says it right there, the language is quite uh, uh, vivid. His bloodthirsty house. Saul, because of Saul, his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. Saul did not consider the oath that Joshua took to be more important than his desire to kill these people. And that violated, and he was the king. So when the king violates a rule like that, the people suffer until God raises up that next king. And who would that be? The one who was inquiring of the Lord. That was the next one. That should give you a good hint, right? You want to be in leadership, you better know how to inquire of the Lord, and you better know how to hear him. And then if I might put in a commercial here, you should be praying that me and Tricia and the rest of our leadership team are hearing from the Lord. <laughs> right? Should be really high on your prayer list. That we're getting enough rest and enough sleep and that we're not getting... Remember, my, um, Moses had a, a father-in-law named Jethro. And Jethro said, look, what you're doing is not good. You're getting caught up in all the details of the people here. And you need to delegate this authority. You need to be Godward so the leaders can face out towards the people and handle the issues. And I don't mean that in a selfish way. I'm just saying if we want a healthy culture here, and how many don't, I hope we all do, then me and Trish especially, are, as we're getting the direction uh, for where the church is going to go, we need to be hearing from God. Not our idea, not a good idea. Take one of those O's out, put a capital G. It's got to be a God idea, not a good idea. Say la on that one. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So leaders in the kingdom have to help people understand knowledge, not just give them facts, because knowledge is how do I apply, how do I turn facts into wisdom? How do I know how to handle my relationships better? How do I know how to uh, be a better father and a husband and a better employee on my job and, and all the different roles I play? How many of us are still helping out our parents right now? Just, you know show of hands, a lot of people in here and, and our the current generation's living so much longer, right? And I have one client, couple, husband and wife, who I went to high school with, all four of their parents are in their 90s and still driving, all four of them, <laughs> and still live in the same houses that they grew up, grew up in, that they raised their family. Like, I never heard that 30 years ago when I first started. As a financial advisor, never had people live, you know, maybe one or two, but not all four in one family. That's some good genes, huh? But think about what that does, because now the couple is thinking that they're going to be able to, you know, own a home and put their kids through college. And now all of a sudden, I have both my parents I got to think about, too. And, and that takes up a big chunk of time. And Lord, help me with that, because that's not an easy one, is it? might sound easy. It's not so easy. You got in-laws, and then you got outlaws. No. Not in the kingdom. Not in the kingdom. But that's one of those ways you need wisdom, is to know how to handle the family dynamics. Don't let them turn into dynamite. 
right? No, we don't want that. We want to respect our parents. That life may go well with us. I'm just going to take a quick poll. How many are cold right now? Man, there's a lot of hands going up. Josh gave me a little clue. He's got, he didn't put the hood on yet, but he has his jacket. Okay, and then there's a couple over here. So I'm very discerning, Josh. <laughs> we'll, we'll raise it a point. <laughs> so, um, man, this is so important that we are in life-giving relationships and that we don't perish for a lack of knowledge. I remember seeing a show on TV once, and um, it was in a, a developing country. You know, they used to call it third world countries, and I don't like to call it third world. But, you know, just developing. They're, they're new to getting electricity in certain parts of these countries, right? And there was a wire down from a storm, and somebody stepped in a puddle where the wire was live, and they were killed. But other people didn't understand the connection, so they were running in to try to help the first person, and they were getting electrocuted. So they were perishing for a lack of knowledge, and you and I would take that for granted. But if it's new to you, how would you make the connection? You wouldn't have known why. See, so we need each other. We have to speak into each other's lives and not allow each other to perish for a lack of knowledge. And sometimes that's difficult because people get deceived in the kingdom too, right? It's not just out in the world. And it's like, oh, well, you know, if God really wanted me to be happy, he would have given me a different wife, and he wants me to be happy, so it's okay if I leave this one and go find another one. And you're like, time out. Where's the chapter and verse on that one, bro? Not in my Bible, unless you've got a different translation. And, and you've got to help them not to perish, because they're going to perish if they're going to go off what the Lord says. It's on us to tell each other. Even when it sounds hard to tell somebody a difficult thing, you got to be honest, amen? Now, you have to do it in love, and that's where the leadership team comes in, and you come to us, and you can ask us, you know, how should I handle this? Hopefully, we're giving you life-giving advice. That's up to you to decide. But it's interesting that Hosea then also says, because you've rejected knowledge, right? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests. There's a qualification to being in leadership in the kingdom of God. God loves his people too much to allow people who are rejecting knowledge to stay in authority. So we have to be very humble. We have to stay pliable. You'll notice that one of the problems of a religious attitude is that people stop wanting to learn. They think they know it all. They think they've got every angle on every verse in every chapter of the Bible. And look, that's not a good thing, is it? No, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by... Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So can he give you a preceding word? Oh, you better believe it, and you better be living on those preceding words because that's why it says right in the next one that he doesn't do anything without revealing it to his prophets. It's really good to be in connection with prophetic people. And we are, and Chuck Pierce will be here in three weeks, right? That's the Sunday the 31st. Uh, and, and if you get a chance to go down, it's right near Atlantic City where we're going to be on the Friday and Saturday night. That would be the 29th and 30th. Galloway, New Jersey is really right outside of Atlantic City. And this is an unusual uh, opportunity in New Jersey to have both Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce to be here Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday and Saturday down there, Sunday here. So look, you know, uh, I feel like it's a really good investment because it's not that uh, regular that they get in this area together especially. And yes, it's an investment of time, but you will you'll come out of that with a, a, a depth charge that goes off in your spirit and kind of wakes you up. <laughs> Remember that last week when we were talking about it from Haggai? The prophet came in and said to the people, consider your ways. That's what happens when you get around prophetic people. <laughs> and that's not always fun, but boy, it's important. Right? They have a plumb line. They have an ability to speak into a situation, to see where things are, to know where we should be going, and to know how to get us from where we are to where we should be going. And I don't know about you, but I love that verse in the Bible. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they, they build it in vain. I don't want to build in vain. Do you? Like, we don't have enough time that we could be wasting time. So I'd rather hear the prophet right off the bat. As long as you trust the prophet, right? And we do. Trust 
Chuck uh, implicitly. Trisha travels all over the world with him and, and will be again, you know, many more times. So it's not like he's some distant person. We're friends. We know them. We trust them. It's, it's a very reliable source for the word. Amen? No small thing. All right, I'm going to keep going. And then uh, I'm going to go to that one with the little chart on it, the next one. And this is a book that Trisha and our team, that be Easter and Cindy and David on our team here, a church that do a lot of ministry, prayer ministry. Uh, it's called Breaking Curses. I'm sorry, Blessing or Curse You Can Choose uh, from Derek Prince. It's about breaking curses. So I just pulled some nuggets out of there, and I'm going to try to just demystify it a little bit because I'm guessing a lot of us just automatically think of witchcraft when we think of curses, right? That's understandable. We, we grew up with it. I was you know, a little kid, and my mother wasn't a Christian at the time, and I was watching that show Bewitched on TV. Anybody remember that one? What was the mom's name? Andorra. Remember Andorra? That was the mom. That wasn't the daughter. That was the mom's name was Andorra. I didn't ask the question right. You will not be penalized for that point. Where do we get Andorra from? The witch of Endor in the Bible. I, did you know that? Like everywhere, everywhere you turn, the devil's trying to sneak his junk in. It's a little kid show. And we're watching it about witches. Like, that's not good. But that's not the only thing a curse is about. It certainly is about that, but it's way more than that, too. You can curse yourself by speaking things over yourself that don't agree with what God says about you. Other people can speak word curses over you that don't agree with what God says about them. I'm, I'm curious. There was a movie with Kevin Costner. He was a, a running coach. And I can't remember. McFarland, I think, was the name of it. It was the name of a town in California. True story. Anybody else see it besides a couple of us here? It's really good. Would you agree? Really good. Like, the theme is good. And there's a scene that I've just never forgotten since I saw it when um, they're called Pickers. The kids that have to go out and work in the field in the morning before they go to school, then they go to school all day, and then they got to go back home, and they have to pick again in the fields. I think it was almonds, if I remember right. And um, they were great athletes, these kids, but they never had a chance to go and play on the team. And like I said, it's a true story. They ended up winning the state championship against all these hoity-toity kids with the uniforms on, and these kids didn't have any money, but they had great heart, man. And they were getting scholarships to go to college for track. And one of the kids' fathers are sitting around the fire at night, and he said, pickers never go to college. You're never going to amount to anything. You remember this? I was like, man, it just lit up in front of me. I go, that's a word curse. The father is speaking a word curse over his son. Fathers are not supposed to speak curses over their kids. But fathers and mothers, primary relationship like that, we have authority in what we say. Life and death, what? You know the verse is in the power of our tongue and choose life. That's what God expects. You're, you know, if you want to get technical, they're not your kids. They're his kids. And he expects us to speak life over them and not death. You know, this could start to get a little hostile and we could start blaming our parents if we're not careful. I don't want you to blame your parents. You need to have a default setting. And this is not easy, but you have to say they did the best they could. Let's practice that. They did the best they could. <laughs> Don't roll your eyes when you say it. <laughs> oh, if that was their best. That's not what we're asking for. I mean, God will still take it if you say it. But he'd rather have you have a little bit more empathy in there. Because hurt people hurt people. So chances are pretty good that that picker's father was repeating a curse that his father had spoken over him, right? Because hurt people hurt people. So when do we ever break this thing? With the blood of Jesus. Because you're in a new generation now. You're in a new family. You're not subject to those curses of your family line because you're in a new family. Look around. These are your brothers and sisters. Aren't they beautiful? You'll be a little more enthusiastic about that. Yes, y'all are looking good. You know, like Amy Grant said, you have your father's eyes. Mm. So look at what Derek Prince said here is, 
he just broke it down right out of the Bible in Deuteronomy 28. There's so much in there about blessing and cursing. It's all the whole chapter of Deuteronomy 28 is about. And what happens when you're obedient, which is your left side there, it says, you are exalted by the Lord. You have good health, reproductiveness, prosperity, victory, and God's favor. How many like that? Sounds like the right choice to me. Because on the right side, excuse me, when you disobey, you face humiliation, barrenness, unfruitfulness, mental and physical sickness, family breakdown, poverty, defeat, oppression, failure, and God disfavor. That's a half a chapter. That's an awful lot in there, all over disobedience. It's that simple. If you obey, the blessing comes. If you disobey, and you see why people perish for lack of knowledge? They want to obey. They don't know the word. Whoever played with a Ouija board growing up? Right? Like, I never knew there was anything wrong with that. It was a game. It was a board game. You could just buy it in any store. Well, we opened ourselves up to witchcraft. Right? So break that thing now. And that might seem like, oh, that's so, it was so long ago. Really? Are you kidding? You guys are a little extreme about this stuff, aren't you? Hey, what do you got to lose? We're praying. We're breaking it off. If your family was involved with the Masonic Lodges, break it off. What do you have to lose? They made covenant with the wrong source. And, and it included you and their family line. Break it off. It's not of the Lord. All right? There's plenty of things we could talk about. I don't want to get too specific other than just to say right here in, in this book, he speaks a lot about obedience and disobedience as being the root cause of a lot of the problems that we face. And really, if you think about what David was facing, there was a famine in the land. So where would that fall on that? You know, it's not on the left side, that's for sure. A famine in the land's on the right side. It could be under failure, defeat, and poverty because they had no food, barrenness, and unfruitfulness. They were starving. And all because Saul had broken a covenant. And you could say it's not fair to the rest of the people that one man's sin could impact everybody's. Well, Adam's sin impacted all of us. But another man came, <laughs> Jesus, the second Adam came. And then God raises up a young man who's got an ear for the Lord, David, and he says, you know what? This famine, there's some bigger cause here. I'm going to inquire of the Lord, and then it gets revealed. See, it gets revealed to the prophet, because David was a prophet. If you're not sure about that, we'll have another conversation, or come out on Tuesday nights. We've been talking about that. I'm going to go to the next one. I quoted this already. Proverbs 18, 21. Sorry, just checking my time. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, I'm guessing everybody here has heard that verse before, right? But it's really good to remind yourself of it, too. Tricia touched on it very briefly when she said that we tried fasting negative confessions, negative words. Try it sometime. Try to catch yourself every time you say a negative word coming out of your mouth. Ten minutes. <laughs> Not necessarily, maybe a little bit longer, but it's hard. So here it is. I have to choose if I'm going to speak death or life. I'm going to speak life. How about you? Now, this is another really key curse-breaking kind of principle here. The next verse is Proverbs 25, 28. He has no, I'm sorry, this is the King James. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. I can't tell you how many times I've quoted this verse in the 19, now 20 years since we started the church, okay? It just comes up all the time because so many of our problems, including the curses that we're, that we're subject to, are a result of us not being in rulership of our spirit man. And one of the phrases that's used is getting hijacked emotionally, right? Everybody here know what it's like to get emotionally hijacked? Am I looking around for honest people here? Uh, some people hide behind the pole. I don't think you did it on purpose, Mike. But it's like, OK, ah, I see him nodding over there. And uh, like that is not a good place to be. All right? You want to just unpack this a little bit? If the devil has a choice, does he want you grounded in the Lord, or does he want you in chaos? Real easy answer, right? When you're emotionally hijacked, are you grounded in the Lord, or are you in chaos? Well, then there you go. So he's going to look for every button he can push on you to get you emotionally hijacked. And what are some of the emotions you feel that cause you to get hijacked? Fear is one of them, right? But what are we seeing this morning to counter that? You don't stand a chance when I stand in God's love. Fear, you don't stand a chance. 
Perfect love casts out all fear. But it's not just fear, if you're Sicilian. <laughs> what else could get you hijacked? <laughs> anger, woo! But it's not just Sicilians that deal with anger. That's a human universal. <laughs> Anywhere you go in the world, people get angry. How about betrayal? I would guess that that's a human universal too, that when you're suffering from being betrayed, you get emotionally hijacked because you were counting on so many things based on that piece of information, and then you find out they lied to you. And, and that pillar that you were leaning on just fell out from under you, and you have no rock of foundation under you. And that's what's so beautiful about the Lord saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am faithful. I'm not going to betray you. You can build on this rock, and it's not going to fall out from under you. And betrayal, I mean, you would say, that's not my fault that somebody betrayed me, right? But you could still be emotionally hijacked. And that's when the enemy attacks, when you're hijacked. And that's why you shouldn't get drunk. Because you're not in control of yourself when you're drunk. And he has open target practice at you when your spirit, it's right here, he says it. You're like a city with your walls broken down when you're drunk. I heard a statistic this week. 50%. Of all rapes on college campus, the person that does the rape is drunk and the one that gets rape is drunk, raped is drunk. So the guy was saying, if you want to cut down on, on rape on the college campus, take the alcohol out. <laughs> That's way too common sense, isn't it? <laughs> you pay in tuition so your kid can go get raped at college? I don't think so, right? It's like some big free open party when they go there. And look, that's not really what we're talking about. But it, the point is, you can get hijacked when you're not in control of yourself. That's why it's a sin. Clearly spelled out in the Bible. Not, not having a glass of wine, not a sin. Being drunk, no doubt about it. Clearly a sin. And it's not hard to figure out why. Because you can't be in right, right alignment with God when you're out of control of yourself. But anger will make you get out of control of yourself. So are you supposed to suppress your anger? Glad you knew that. I guess maybe by the way I asked the question. I'm trying to help you. Because suppressing your anger will not make it go away. It will make it build up. And then you will see the volcano. How many can remember when your father was starting to go there? Like, oh. Here's what I learned. Never ask him for anything until he's having dessert. <laughs> right? You got the meal, you get the coffee, you got the little cake thing going over on the side. Mom's happy, another day's over, we ate. Hey, Dad, by the way, I borrowed the keys to the car tonight. Much more likely not to see Vesuvius going. <laughs> and once that thing blew, well, you'd want to be within 50 miles. <laughs> He suppressed a lot of anger, um, you know, my dad, he did, he had a problem with it. So it's not that we're supposed to suppress it, but what do we do with it? We take it to the Lord. That sounds like such a cliche Christian answer, but it's really true. There's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, when he was insulted, he did not hurl insults in return. Another version says, when he was reviled, he did not revile again. What did he do? He committed himself to his father, who he knew would judge justly. So he took it to the Lord. I hate the way I'm feeling right now, Lord. I'm very angry. I feel betrayed. I don't want my anger to spill out and, and be like me, be a city with my walls broken down. Because when I'm in that rage state, the devil just has an open attack against me. Let me tell you, today, if you go into a rage state in public, there's 50 phones videotaping you in three seconds. You will not live it down. It will live on the internet forever. Did you see the guy, the conductor getting beat up this week in the train in New York? Oh, my God. The conductor there, I guess whoever was on the train was upset about the way he was driving the train. And, and, and you see all the people on the platform there got their cameras up with their phone. And, and the guy gets the window down and he starts beating the conductor through the window. Like it defiles you just watching it. This is news. Like news, really? I don't think I needed that news. But 
Like, this is how people are. Now, that guy is not going to be able to say he didn't do it. It's been seen by millions of people. And it's just such a setup by the devil. Rule your spirit. A man who doesn't, and a woman who doesn't rule their spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. You're open to attack. Live a disciplined life. All right, so I think I made that point. Who can bring those curses in us? I just wanted to run down a list of things that Easter, Cindy, myself, Trisha, David, you know, people, Lisa in the front row here, we've all done a lot of ministry counseling. And even though each person is uniquely complex, right? The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You see certain patterns that start to develop. And this first one that I've already mentioned is that people with authority in your life, like your parents or teachers or coaches that you might have had, or like if you took piano lessons, like I said, that movie Whiplash, I don't recommend it. But if you ever saw it, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's the guy that does this, you know? The, the teacher, like that means stop playing. Just stop playing now. Like, whoa, that's abuse. That's emotional abuse. This guy was, in the name of trying to make them better players, he was emotionally abusing them. And one of the kids commits suicide because he can't handle it, right? That's, that's the devil's outcome. They'll squeeze people through this funnel, and the, the ones that look strong survive coming out the other side, but you lose a bunch of people along the way, and the ones that survived on the other side are not so strong. They just deaden the pain along the way. You don't want to motivate people with fear, that's not Jesus. That's the devil. Jesus motivates us with love. That's what fear of the Lord means, reverence for him. I don't want to sin against you, Lord, because I love you, not because I'm afraid you're going to kill me. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to offend you. You saved me. How can I turn my back on you when you pulled me out of that mess that I was in? So authority figures, and many of you are authority figures. So you really got to be running on the right fuel so that you're not speaking death over people. Now, if you have, you can go back and repent, and you can apologize for that, and you need to, because that same authority, when you hurt the person, works in healing as well. When you repent, and you get it right, and you ask them to forgive you, and you get them to say, I forgive you, don't pull one of these, oh, well, no, it really didn't hurt so bad. Oh, yes, it did. You're allowed to say it hurt. You should say it, and they would know. Don't do that to anybody else the way you did that to me. That's not, you know, that's not mean. You need to say it. So I just said people with authority in your life can bless or curse you with their words. If they have cursed you, what should you do? Yes, forgive them. Absolutely. What if they're not alive? Can you forgive their memory? Well, you all knew that one. That's a good one, right? Um, I can't remember the name of the movie. I think it was Courageous. It was a Christian movie. Was it courageous where the guy stands at his father's, uh, in, in the cemetery, he stands and he speaks over his father's grave and he forgives his father. Really powerful scene. And you, you can do that. But if they're alive, like Joyce F Meyer's father was still alive, the Lord asked her to start to minister to him while he was alive. And, uh, and then she led him to the Lord. Like, how powerful is that? So we're not going to go into detail here, but if you think by not dealing with it, it's going to go away, <laughs> you're wrong about that. So you need to bring it to the Lord and say, I don't want the toxic effects of that relationship, those words that were spoken over me, to defile me any longer. I have too much work to do for the kingdom of God to allow this thing to slow me down. Imagine if you put sand in your gas tank right? That would kill the engine, right? But that's what running on bad fuel, that's what that's like. You're functioning, the car's barely putter, puttering along, but why would you keep sand in the tank? No, no, you're going to clean that thing out by just getting the right attitude and saying, I forgive that person who cursed me, and I'm not, not only not going to curse them back, I'm going to bless them back. Oh, how hard is that? Anybody here find that easy? <laughs> No, right? We all know that how hard that one is. But Jesus clearly told us to do it. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Here's how it came to me was, Lord, give them a personal revival in their lives. But I'm going to go to the second one because this is tied in in my life and my family's life is we were in an abusive religious situation. 
And in some ways, that's harder than like a family situation because you're connecting God to the person who's hurting you. And now it's hard to separate your feelings out for the person who's hurting you, whether it's God or if it's the person. And you have to, you know, try to sift all that stuff through and get counsel on it. But, you know, here's what it said. I came down to in my life. I had to make a decision if I was going to be bitter and angry about it or if I was going to say, no, that's going to slow me down from my calling. And I'm not letting the devil slow me down from my calling. If I have to bless this person, then I'm going to pray they have a revival in their life. Because I know they knew the word. And I think a lot of the reason that they were hurting us is because they were hurt themselves. And they never had somebody come alongside with an arm around their shoulder and say, hey, have you ever considered this? Have you ever thought about it? Somebody with authority in their lives didn't speak to them. So there's all this downline stuff. If it doesn't get dealt with, it just keeps propagating the wrong thing. So that was an authority figure that represented God that was abusive. That's a tough one, right? But here, it's so beautiful to say, picture them with their, their hands up, having a personal revival in their room, and then realizing, I'm going to go back and apologize to Pete for what I did. That's good, right? That's handling your side. That's what the Bible says, is that with whatever is in your power, pursue peace with all men. That means you can handle your half of the equation. You can't handle theirs, but you can handle yours. How you do it, you got to hear from God on that, right? No, no good ideas here. God ideas. Lord, how should I handle this? Lord, why is there a famine? David said. And the Lord answered him. So, Lord, I have this broken relationship where I felt betrayed, and I feel like it's an open door to a curse in my life. I want it broken off. How should I handle it? Will he answer you? Yes. We don't always hear him when he answers, so he'll keep talking, but that's, that's something we can rely on, that he will answer us. And how about you can bless or curse yourself? She's not here, so I won't talk much about Trisha, but she um, grew up in a tough situation. In, in her neighborhood, back in the 60s, we were both growing up. Uh, we were like, I think, 11, 12 years old during the race riots. And uh, I don't know if anybody here remembers, but there were tanks going down Springfield Avenue in Newark, National Guard tanks. There were riots going on. And there were a lot of fights. There were kids bringing guns to the school that I went to. And she was in Patterson, right? So there were fights all the time. And she just grew up in a very violent environment, not through any of her own choosing. And her sister, well, you could tell if this is true or not, but her sister's right here and the other one's right there, called her olive oil because <laughs> she was skinny. <laughs> she says that she has since made up for that, but I think she looks great. Point is, she didn't, you know, she had to watch out for a stiff wind, <laughs> and yet she's having to fight, right? That does a lot of trauma to your spirit as a kid, right? Now, it works really good in the deliverance room now that she knows how to fight because she's not afraid. Isn't that cool? God makes all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So even that fear, the, the Lord turned her, the devil meant for evil, the Lord turned her around for good and taught her how, like, you can face the fear and still win. Man, that's powerful. But, you know, there were some uh, inner vows and ungodly beliefs that she made as a child that she had to deal with as she grew up. And again, that's her testimony. She can, she can tell you her testimony later. But what I admire so much, I saw her do this. She would stand in the mirror and point at herself in the mirror and speak the thing that she believed that she had to cancel that lie. She, she had to believe something different about herself and she would say it to herself in the mirror. That takes guts. You're not running from the thing. You're facing it. You're saying, no what? Devil, you're not lying to me anymore. I am the beloved of God. I am cho I'm part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You put your own promises in there, what the Lord is showing you, but it's a proactive thing. Don't just wait for it to happen. Take a stand and say, no, I'm canceling the lie with the truth of the word. That breaks a curse. What's an inner vow? Something happens to you growing up. Uh, I'll just give you an uh, example from the Sanfords. John and Paula Sanford, we teach a lot of their material. They did counseling for 40 years, and they were pastors and strong in the word. Highly recommend their material. Obviously, we teach it all the time. There was a young girl that came into their ministry for counseling, and she had been raped by her brother when she was a little girl. And she made a vow 
that she would never carry a man-child as a mom when she got older. But not only did she not carry a man-child, she never physically developed. So even though she hit the age when it should have, her body should have been changing, she stayed in the body of an a immature girl. I don't know the right language. For boys, it would be puberty. Is it the same word for girls? Yeah, OK. And I said, no way. I'm thinking, they're off the deep end on this one. Like, there's no way somebody's vow could stop their body from growing. That's the logical science brain that God wants to like say, you know what? My ways are above your ways. Hold the Bible up here. They broke the inner vow, and within two years, she became a fully developed woman. <laughs> now, I don't care if you believe me or not. I don't know that I would have believed it if we didn't see it happen here with somebody that came here. I saw it with my own eyes. It's, it was shocking to me, even though I had heard it. When you see it in real life, you're like, oh my God. You, all my life, you have been faithful. You do miracles I couldn't even imagine. The, the girl came up the aisle one night after service. We were doing the Elijah House class, and now we call it Possessing Your Vessel. And I thought she was 12 or 13 years old. And she was hunched over, and she was so shut down, she didn't even look up, she didn't even want to make eye contact. Uh, fast forward, after a couple of years of ministry, married, baby, fully developed body. She was 17 when she walked up here, and I thought she was 12. All right? So I'm just telling you, he does exceedingly, abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. You can't even imagine the miracles that he can do. But you probably also are underestimating the power of a vow that you need to break. If you made a vow that I'm never going to amount to anything, that thing has a power over you. You've been telling yourself you're never going to amount to anything maybe a million times subconsciously. That does not agree with what God says about you. You need to break that lie. Right now, break it. I, I am going to amount to something because that's who God says I am. I'm his child. He said, I find favor with God and with man. No good thing, he said in the Psalms. Will he withhold from those who walk uprightly? It delights him to see me prosper. He gives me crafty, creative inventions. Speak it over yourself. And if it sounds a little extreme, the devil's also extreme. He's taking people out. Suicide's never been higher in America. Isn't that unbelievable with all our prosperity? Opioid use and suicide is the highest ever because people just keep trying to medicate their pain. So if speaking to yourself in the mirror seems extreme, it's certainly a better option than killing yourself or you know, uh, meditating or medicating your pain. So that's inner vows. There's plenty more I could talk about. But then, un yeah, I guess the ungodly beliefs go right in hand with that. And if you need a counter to the ungodly beliefs, you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds, and that we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, that we tear down those logical thought patterns, those things that look like they make sense in the natural, but they rise, they raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. They come in direct uh, counteroffensive against the truth of God's word. We all have those thought patterns in there that try to creep in, and you have to take it captive. Hold it as a prisoner. No, you're not allowed in. I don't believe you. You're a liar, Satan. You're the father of lies, and I'm taking that thought captive before it comes in. Uh, I already touched on the occult. Um, Again, I'm not the expert on our team about this. Trisha really has spent so much more time on it. She could speak and will, I'm sure. But I already mentioned Ouija boards. How about Eastern religions? Ever hear the testimony of Ravi Zacharias? He was raised a Hindu in, uh, in India. And now he's one of the most well-known and gifted apologetics teachers in the world. He goes around the world defending Christianity with full knowledge of how the other religions work. And, and, not, and it, not demeaning the other religions, but just saying this is how Christianity is different. But you open yourself up if you start, like, some of the martial arts stuff, not a good idea. Yoga, sorry, not a good idea. You want to take a stretching class? Take a stretching class. The idea that there's Christian yoga, I'm sorry. You think we're extreme? I'm trying to help you. 
Get a stretching video. You don't need yoga. All right? Why would you take the chance of opening yourself up to that stuff? It's all baked into Eastern religions. Don't do it. There's plenty of other things you can do to accomplish the same thing without opening yourself up to stuff. All right. I, I don't, again, not the expert on that. But how about family practices of witchcraft? We've dealt with a lot of people. Uh, when we were, prior to coming out here, we were in Essex County, and there was a bigger Hispanic population. There is a Hispanic population here as well, but there was a much bigger population where we were. And a lot of people came in because their families had been involved with what they call Santeria. You know what that is? It's a, I guess it's from the islands, and it's a form of witchcraft. Again, I'm not an expert on it, but I saw the manifestations of what was happening to the people as they were getting free. And it was like something else took over. That's a curse. That's somebody speaking a curse over you. And you could even say, well, how could I give them the benefit of the, of the doubt if my parents did that? I'll tell you how. They were doing the best they could because they were told by their parents that the only way to keep a violent death away is to invite this spirit of death in to protect you from a violent death. I mean, you talk about being deceived, right? But listen, whose fault is that? It's the church's fault because that lady probably never heard the gospel. If we were out there giving the good news, they'd at least have a second alternative. But if that's all they ever grew up with, or if they tried to go to church and there was no power in the church they went to, then you can't blame them for seeking dark power because people are seeking power. And they're going to find it somewhere. I hope they find it here, don't you? Because this one's going to keep them a whole lot cleaner a whole lot longer than, than the dark arts. And then abuse. Um, I touched on Joyce Meyer, but... I can honestly say uh, nothing scrambles a person more than sexual abuse, especially as a child, but really at any time in life. There's something so profound about the way we're designed, and I quoted it already, but it says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we are made for covenant relationship between a husband and wife who are fully committed to each other, that have made a covenant lifetime relationship before we open up the door to intimacy. And when we open up a door to intimacy prior to that covenant relationship, our wiring gets scrambled on the inside. It's not permanently scrambled because God can heal anything. And many times we've spoken about restoring of our innocence. You can go on our uh, page right now, our Facebook page, and get a clip of a video that Jim Anderson spoke about when he was here I know a lot of you probably didn't actually make it to the meeting, but this is just a six-minute clip, and it's called Restoring Innocence. So you can hear the story. There was a 20-year-old girl that came to his ministry school out in Spokane, Washington, and as they were driving through the city, she said, oh, I ate at the restaurant up on the uh, 40th floor of that building. There's no prices on the menu. And, and the teacher was looking at her like, what do you mean? How, how the heck did you get up there? And she said, oh, I was a $2,000 a night call girl before I came to ministry school. <laughs> but God, three years later, after a lot of ministry, married, kids, awesome life. <laughs> but God, any situation can be turned around. Amen? So it's not that I mean to make it worse than it is, but I don't want to underestimate how devastated people are when they've gone through this. And if you haven't gone through it, it would be hard for you to possibly know what it feels like to be violated at that level, right? But, you know, watching the video by Joyce Myers is a good way to get a window into it. And she's so grounded in the word now, she came out the other side. And we can help people. And, and every year that goes by, there's more and more people that are dealing with some form of sexual abuse somewhere. That's a curse that's over their lives that needs to be broken. They feel defiled. They feel dirty. And they don't have to. God can restore innocence. Amen? That man that married that girl that had been a prostitute saw her as a virgin before the Lord. He really did because he had such a strong relationship with the Lord. He knew that one sin is no worse than any other sin. And when God cleanses you, you get a fresh start. And, and he accepted her as she was, as God's daughter, and we're getting married, and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. Isn't that awesome? That would take a mature person, wouldn't it? But, but for the grace of God, there go I. <laughs> so your family could have been involved in witchcraft, 
and you might need cleansing from that. You need, might need to break a curse of witchcraft from your family line. Uh, the Masonic Lodge stuff, you might not even be aware that a couple of generations back, people were involved in the Masonic Lodges. And it's not just that one. There's plenty of other ones. Break it off, okay? Just break it off. Stop giving the enemy an entry point. There's no harm in praying. And then, uh, I, I guess, boy, there's a whole lot of stuff out here, isn't there? I put media down because I don't think we also realize the amount of stuff we're opening our spirit up to when we watch television and horror movies. Why do you think people, I don't know if anybody here watches horror movies. I hope you don't because why would you put your spirit through that kind of trauma? Well, that's not a rhetorical question. Why do people do that? Do you know? Yeah, it's, uh, Josh could speak to it clinically because that's his job, but they're so starving of emotion in their lives, they become so numbed that they want to feel some emotion. So they'll watch a really scary movie just to have a counterfeit version of what it feels like to feel, even if it's a negative feeling. But they're opening themselves up to all kinds of garbage of fear, like it's not worth it. Come to a worship service at King of Kings. You will feel. <laughs> Without the dark arts. <laughs> I've had people come up to me and say, well, I didn't like it, but I could tell you sure liked it, Pastor. <laughs> That's a left-handed compliment if I ever heard one. Um, the sexual abuse and the emotional terrorism um, are cousins. Emotional abuse... Well, yeah, you know, I can't talk briefly about these things. They're just too com complex, but it could be a curse. If somebody was harassing you over a long period of time, holding a gun to your head every night and say, if you say anything, I'm going to kill you. Right? Never touched you, but threatened you with terrorism on a regular basis. How is that worse than beating you? It's not. It's emotional abuse. It's what they do in prison camps. They wear people down. If you talk to any prisoners of war, nobody gets through torture without talking. They all break at some point, and you can break people with emotional abuse. That's a curse. You lost part of yourself through that emotional abuse, but can God restore it? He makes all things work together for good. How? Well, okay, that's why we need the prophetic. I don't know how. I just know he wants us to be in the middle here and, and to bring reconciliation. As hurt as you are, as the, whatever the horrible situation you went through, nothing's too big or too hard for him. Amen? All right, I'm going to wrap up with some verses. You all have been a great audience here. I'm sorry, I know it's 12.09 already. But it's good to finish with some verses because you need to build yourself up in the Word. And, and, here's some, and I'll, I'll send these slides to anybody who wants them. So if you need the verses, some of you taking pictures, any, anybody who wants them, you can have them. 1 Peter 2. You find God's favor by what? Deciding to please God. Can you say it out loud with me? Deciding. How many of you are deciding right now to please God? <laughs> right. That's a big, good first step. You find his favor when you decide that you want to please him. I don't know how exactly that looks every single day and every minute of every day, but if my decision is, Lord, I want to start by saying I want to please you with what I do, then watching pornography is never going to be on the list. All right? We can rule that one out right now. Being drunk is never going to be on the list. Somebody says, man, I had a rough day. I need a drink. Be careful on your confession that you're totally saying that God's not enough because that drink is more important. You don't need a drink. You need Jesus. Come to worship. <laughs> That's better than a drink. And it's cheaper. It's free. All right. Decide to please God. Even when you endure hardships because of unjust suffering, <sighs> for what merit is it to endure mistreatment if you do something wrong? So that's a difficult thing because that's another way you get emotionally hijacked is when you're mistreated for something because it wasn't your fault and you're getting blamed. Boom, here it comes again, that, that hijacking like, oh no, wait a minute, you're blaming me for the wrong thing. Jesus said, no, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't. Curl them back. He committed to his father. Lord, you'll take care. Now we, got, we went from people having coats on to people fanning themselves. All for one degree on the, on the temperature. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Yet if you're mistreated when you do what's right and you faithfully endure it, what? This is commendable before God. Oh, that sounds like a high calling, doesn't it? 
that you're going to act right. <laughs> you're mistreated even though you did the right thing, but you faithfully endured it. That's a good way to please God. In fact, you were called to this. That hurts, doesn't it? I was called to be mistreated? No. You were, everybody's going to be mistreated, but you have to make a choice when you get mistreated how you're going to act. And if you have to demand your rights and you have to prove to everybody that you're the right one and you're like totally not acknowledging God that he could take care of all this. And if you're, the, the, how it ties into the curse is if you're cursing those people who did you wrong, you just open yourself up to a curse. Don't do it. He can take care of this. Verse, well, this is actually uh, the verse I quoted, verse 23. When he, Jesus, was verbally abused, he did not return it with an insult. When he suffered, he wouldn't threaten retaliation. He faithfully entrusted himself into the hands of God who judges righteously. Got room for a couple more? And then we'll end. And then we'll pray. Okay. Colossians 2. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record. Anybody with a record is really happy about that. We call that getting expunged. <laughs> Isn't that a cool word? Expunged. He canceled out every violation. The iron ironic thing is the violation came from the word. Because once the word came, there was a code book now, and we realized we broke it. <laughs> All have sinned. And all have violated the law. Whew, but he canceled that. The old arrest warrant that stood to indict us, he erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all, and they can't be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. This is the kind of verse you read when you're looking in that mirror and Satan's accusing you and you're saying, no way, Satan. Everything you had against me has been canceled by the blood of Jesus. It was all nailed to the cross. And by the way, Satan, Jesus then made a public spectacle of you. Right there, verse 15. And all the powers and principalities of darkness stripping away from them and you, Satan. Every weapon and all your spiritual authority and power to accuse me. He needs to hear that from you. Out of your mouth, with your voice, and by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around, all Satan and all his co cohorts, as prisoners in a procession. He wasn't their prisoner. They were his prisoner. This is the Passion Version of the Bible. I'm, I'm highly encouraging you all to read the Passion Version. BibleGateway.com. Free. Easy. A thousand different versions. There's no reason not to use it. It's free. <laughs> Acts 19. Yeah. Acts 19. Almost done. Great fear fell over the entire city of Ephesus, and the authority of the name of Jesus was exalted. Many believers publicly confessed their sins and disclosed their secrets. Large numbers of those who had been practicing magic took all their books and scrolls of spells and incantations and publicly burned them. <laughs> It's right in the Bible, right in the New Testament. When revival comes, the bad fuel gets exposed and people don't want it in their lives anymore. Man, when I realized the stuff I had in my album collection when I first got saved, I couldn't get to the garbage truck fast enough. Thankfully, my family's in the garbage business, so I just called the foreman. I said, where are you right now? I'm driving these albums over to your truck. And I met him on Elm Street, and I just took boxes of albums and threw them in the back of the garbage truck. And I really enjoyed hitting that handle and watching them just all break. Satan, your hold over me is broken. Never to be reassembled. <laughs> right prior to Acts 19, Paul says this amazing thing on Mars Hill when he's talking to the unbelievers. He says, in the past, God tolerated our ignorance of these things, but now the time of deception has passed away. Man, speak that over yourself too. I am not going to be deceived any longer. I'm not falling victim to curses other people put on my life. I've got the power to break those things off of me. And he commands us to repent. I'm going to finish on this last one. Um, he became a curse in our place. We can stand, okay, because this is the last one I want to, I want to talk about. And um, I think it's good to try to make a declaration into the atmosphere, because a lot of the things that Jesus asks us to do are really difficult. Amen? Forgiveness being one of them. But boy, this is one too. Luke chapter 6, verse 28. This is a really difficult one. We've already talked about it, but here's the verse if you want to know where it's written in the Bible. 
Let's say it out loud together. Ready? Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. All right, so just look at yourself right now, however you do that, and say, I'm going to try to do this. <laughs> I'm really going to try to do this. Lord, help me try to do this because I can't do it in my own strength. I want to see a revival hit the people who've hurt me. It's hard to say that, isn't it? It's hard to say it. I can tell some of you hesitated. I'm not sure I want to say that. Yeah, no, it's a good thing to say. I want to see a revival hit the people who tried to hurt me. Well, they, I mean, they didn't just try to hurt me. They did hurt me. But I want to see a revival hit them. I don't want bad things to happen to them. I want good things to happen to them. I want them to come to their senses. I want them to experience the goodness of God. I want them to be able to sing, all my life, God, you have been faithful. In spite of what they did to me, hurt people, hurt people. I'm going to bless that person who despitefully used me. And then it's the same thing in Romans, in case you weren't sure. Romans 12, 14 says almost identically, it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then verse 10 of Galatians 3 says, but if you choose to live in bondage under the legalistic rule of religion, you live under the law's curse. For it's clearly written that utterly cursed is everyone who fails to practice every detail and requirement that's written in the law. And you might be wondering, well, how does that fit in here? Well, look, you're going to be measured with the same measure you use. So if you're going to hold everybody else up to an impossible standard, you're going to have to get the mirror and look at yourself too. That doesn't give you the right to have cheap grace, right? It doesn't mean you can just go sin because nobody can be perfect. But it means before you start meeting it out to other people, take a look in the mirror yourself first. Maybe there's a telephone pole in your eye as you're trying to get that little splinter out of that other person's eye, right? So look, you got to be careful how you use the law. It's not a battering ram. It's not a weapon to hit somebody with. It's meant to be something that shows us that we can't do it, that we need Jesus. We can't live up to it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So don't live under the bondage of legalistic rule of religion. There's a prophetic oil aspect of Holy Ghost that we need here to show us how to live it out and how to do it. And then here he says in verse 13, which is really where I'm going to end, yet Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. Now, let me just tell you, he wasn't saying he's going to set us free from the law. We still read the Old Testament. It says the curse of the law, which is you can't fulfill it. <laughs> it's actually a good thing to get it when, you, when it makes you realize you can't do it. And it sets the rules down and says, I need a savior. The curse was you can't live up to it. So it's not that God was mean to give us the law knowing that we couldn't live up to it. It's not the law he's cursing. It's the curse of the law. Hopefully that explained it a little bit. He absorbed it completely and became a curse in my place. <laughs> you want to how to break curses? You just get under the shield of Jesus. No matter what was said to you, no matter what was done to you, no matter horrible things that happened to you, Jesus, you took that curse from me. You became a curse in my place. I'm not going to curse other people and open up another whole door. I'm going to bless them. I'm praying for revival to hit them. Lord, let it be like the Book of Acts in the second chapter, fire on them, not to burn them up. <laughs> fire on them. Let them talk a new language and let them get filled with your fire so that they become evangelists for the kingdom of God. Come well, on, let's lift our hands. Lord, I just bless every person that's here, anybody who's listening today. Thank you for the, 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 their ability to keep their hearts open to listen to what we were talking about. I pray that they were nourished by the truth of the word of God. Even though it's a difficult topic and difficult things that we have to deal with, you are greater. Greater is he in us than the one that's coming against us in the world. You are greater, Lord. And we are not going to live below the full potential that you've placed inside of us. We're not going to run our engines on bad fuel. We choose to detox. We choose to flush out the junk and the garbage that's in there so that we can elevate higher into you. Thank you, Lord, that David, we read it, when he saw the famine, he didn't just sit by. He inquired of you, and you answered. <laughs>